Okay, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to share some things with you this morning that, that we've been teaching in, our, in my Sunday school class. And um, so a lot of this is going to be, it's going to be refresher for them. But for many of you, obviously, those of you that aren't in the class, you know, this will be um, new teaching for you. But I just felt I knew at some point I was going to bring it to the church and and I just felt like that this week was the time to do it. And obviously, it's not everything that we've been studying now for the, this new studies or series we're in for the last month or so. But but uh, it's the basics of it. So. Uh, Genesis chapter one, <clears throat> the title of today's sermon is Keep It Simple. Keep it simple. And I think that we have a slide somewhere. There it is. Keep it simple. All right. Anybody ever heard the, uh, the acronym KISS, K-I-S-S, keep it simple? Stupid, right. And I didn't want to name the sermon that, but uh, because I thought that anybody that doesn't hear the sermon may look at that and get offended. But, uh, but keep it simple, stupid. And I can't remember. Can anybody remember who came up with that? Who made that famous? Um, I didn't check into it, and it's not important anyway, but, uh, but keep it simple, stupid. And we're going to go way back to the very beginning of everything <clears throat> and, and see, see the simplicity of the Christian life. It's really not that hard. It, it's really not. And God didn't set it up to be hard. God doesn't make it hard. And we're, we're experts at doing that. But... Um, so this morning, I'd like to take us all the way back to the beginning, back in Genesis. And, uh, and I'm going to try to keep this sermon simple. Um, <clears throat> but uh, look at chapter 1 and verse 26. Chapter 1 and verse 26. Uh, Genesis, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over the earth, uh, over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. And over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Verse 29. And God said, Behold, I give you every... Uh, herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree uh, in the which is the fruit of a yielding a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life I have given every green herb for meat and it was so and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Turn over to chapter 2 and go to find verse 7, which for me, I have to turn a page or two. A lot of notes in my Bible, but um, verse 7 of chapter 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground may the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And skip down to verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in, in the, into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. Let's pray, Holy Spirit of God, empower us, empower me as a, as a preacher this morning, and empower every listener <clears throat> to receive the things that you have for them today, and that they have for all of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God created us <clears throat> in three parts, body, soul, and spirit. 
Now, in my class, I, I go deeper than I will today, but, but that's evident. Those are things that you know. They're things that we just read. And uh, the body was made of the dust of the earth and gave to Adam the ability to experience the physical world around him. That's why you have a body. That's why I have a body. It is to experience the earth the physical earth. It is to walk upon the earth. It is to touch it. It is to eat it. He gave us our senses, uh, hearing, uh, eyesight, smell, taste, touch. And he gave us these things. He gave us a physical body that we might enjoy. We might experience the physical earth. Okay, and at that time, our body was perfect. The earth was perfect. Everything worked together in harmony. But our bodies even to this day, our bodies give us our world consciousness. Okay? Whatever, to whatever extent that you are uh, conscious of the world around you, and I mean the physical world around you, it's because of your body. All right? Next, the spirit was given to Adam when God breathed into him the breath of life, and the purpose was for Adam to use his spirit to communicate with God. We don't communicate with God through the flesh. We communicate with the earth. We are conscious of the world, the physical world around us, through the flesh. We are conscious of God through the spirit. That is the medium that we use to communicate with God is our spirit. So our, our bodies gave us a world consciousness. Therefore, our spirit gives us a God consciousness. And there's a third part to us called our soul. And this is who you really are. The soul is what, is what uses the body to communicate with the physical earth. The soul is what uses the spirit to communicate with God. The soul is what is eternal. The soul will spend either eternity separated from God or uh, in torment, or the soul will spend eternity... Um, with God in everlasting peace and happiness. The soul also plays a part, though, as the decision maker in, in of the three. The body was given to us to experience the world around us, the physical earth. And that body is always sending information to the soul. Information about what it is experiencing. The spirit of God that communicate the spirit which communicates with God sends to the soul information and that experience that it is having with God. The soul then is the decision maker. Whether whether uh, whether you follow like like if the if the body and the spirit are battling against each other, the soul determines which one wins the battle. In this time, before sin entered into the garden, into the world, uh, the, there was perfect harmony. The body never sent a rebellious, the body never sent a, uh, a wicked thought, the body never sent a, a you know, bad information to the soul and said, I want to do this, much like our bodies do today. Our bodies experience the world and the sinfulness of the world and there's sin in our body and it craves the sin in the world and the body will send information uh, to the soul saying, I want to do this. But the body does not act of its own. Then, for a believer here, the spirit, our spirit is communicating with God, God's spirit, and receiving information. And often the body says, I want to do this. I see this. And I think that I want to do that. It's what happened to David, King David. Godly man. But he saw Bathsheba. And his body says, I want Bathsheba. That's a wicked thought. That's a wicked impulse. That's a lustful thing. There's no doubt at some point that, 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 that God's spirit said to David... Don't be going there. You have no business going there. So there was, there was competing information being sent to the soul. And David sinned by saying, well, I'm going to follow my flesh. I'm going to follow the lust of my flesh. And he sinned. And he paid a great price for that. Now, the Bible says so you have body, soul, and spirit. 
uh, spirit communicates with God. The body communicates with the world. The soul, though, is what receives the communications, the experiences, the information, and the desires and says, I, though, I am the one, I'm the decision maker. I will decide whether to follow God or follow the world. The Bible also tells us that we were created in the image of God. The word image means, in the Hebrew, means a shadow. It means shadow. We were created in his shadow. Uh, you remember, and, and in other words, okay, how many of you have ever seen your shadow? <laughs> yes, I, it's not a trick question. I know you all have. And uh, our shadow is exactly what our body's doing. It's not different. It's, this is, you know, Peter Pan in the fairy tale of Peter Pan. Peter Pan had a shadow that left, and his and this whole story there was trying to catch his shadow. Right? That's not the way. That's not the way that it is. We were created that when God moved, we were to move like God moves. We were to be like a shadow. And, and so, what does that mean? A shadow in what way? In our thinking. We see in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see God thinking, and then we see God speaking. So God has intellect, and as a matter of fact, he's, he is a, a, a omniscient. He has all knowledge. So God gave us knowledge immediately. He gave to Adam knowledge. How do we know this? Well, we know that Adam named the animals, right? God didn't tell him what to name them, so we know that Adam was created with intellect and thoughts. So, so when we're made in God's image, it's referring to intellect, thinking, and the emotion is love. The Bible says that God blessed Adam and Eve. We know that he blessed them because he loved them. So he blessed them. So we are created with emotions and emotions are to assist us in this world, in this life. But often emotions run amok. And they, they become the, determine, the determining, uh, the decision maker. I, I love, therefore I do. I like, therefore I do. And that is backwards. And we, we can never look at emotions and say, lead me. Uh, no, we are to lead our emotions, though God gave to us emotions. But anyway, God gave us the ability to think. Our intellect, he gave us the ability to love. So he gave us emotions. And he gave us a will. A will. Uh, a choice, the ability to make a choice. And these, and that's what God is. He thinks, he loves, and he makes choices. And that's the one part of all of this that I, I don't do it so much anymore, but I used to say, God, why did you give me a will? I would have been just, just as happy, I think, if you just made me do right. I don't like failing. I don't like letting God down. I don't like disappointing God. I don't like guilt. I don't, I don't like any of that, but obviously God gave us a will. Because, I mean, uh, really, truthfully, how is love best uh, exemplified? It is through the choosing of something. You know, I, I chose my wife, and my wife chose me. We didn't have to. But, but, but our, you know, our, our emotions helped us make that decision. But nevertheless, it was a decision. And God says, I don't want to make you love me. I want you to choose to love me. So those, these are the ways that we've been created in his, uh, in his image. To think, to love, and to will. To have a choice. And then God places man in the garden. And he gives him freedom. Freedom to use his intellect. Freedom to use his emotions. Freedom to use his will as he seemed fit in the garden. Uh, Adam was Adam and Eve, they were, they were the authorities. Everything was put under their dominion. They were sovereign on the earth under the sovereignty of God. They were the authority on this earth under the authority of God. Okay? So, but he gave them, and he gave them freedom. So, so much Freedom. Uh, to tend the garden as they desired. But, but he also gave them one rule. <laughs> one rule. One rule. And that was what? To not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, you have everything else here. You have everything. The only thing that I have set apart from you is 
this one tree. And that is where their choices would come in to play. Their choices whether to obey God or to disobey God. And what gave them that opportunity was the tree that he told them, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not going to help you. It's only going to hurt you because when you do eat of it, you shall surely what? Die. You're going to die. And that was okay. Apparently that was okay for some period of time. I don't know how long. We read this stuff in the Bible and we think, and the next day, but that's not necessarily so. You know, somebody once said, well, at one time, everybody, 25% of the people on earth were murderers. And I said, explain that one to me. They said, well, there was four people on earth and Cain, Cain killed Abel. So 25% of the people on earth were murderers. I said, those weren't the only people on earth. There's a lot of other people on earth at that time. You know, we, we got to be careful and we got to, you know, in the context of things, don't read into it timelines that God has not provided for us. You can say, well, this happened 10 years later. Well, I'm not going to argue that. I don't know how long ago, uh, how long later it was when, when sin, when Lucifer came into the scene. That's what we're going to go to next. But as long as Adam and Eve uh, in their body, soul, and spirit using their intellect, their emotions, and their will, as long as they trusted and believed in God, everything was in perfect harmony. You and I don't know anything about that. We don't really know what perfect harmony is. We can be in harmony, but, but we have a tainted flesh. We have a sinful nature. And, uh, and they lived in perfect harmony. Now, up to this point, keep it simple. That's pretty simple, right? Everything that we have talked about up to this point is pretty simple. They didn't have all the Old Testament law, which was given to just prove to you that you can't keep, that, you, that you're not a perfect person. We didn't have, you, you, you know, 66 books in the Bible. And, and I mean, they didn't have that. They had one rule. And I know what you think. You think what I think sometimes, which is, they just couldn't keep one rule. Okay. But we are like they are. Well, actually, before they, before they broke the rule, they were perfect, which we've never been perfect. But anyway, up to this point, everything is, is simple. God says, this is very easy. I don't, I, don't, I don't introduce confusion into your life. I don't bring things, you know, like God did not create trigonometry. I'm convinced of that. Okay, look, Algebra 1, I, I, in high school, I got a C- in. All right? And I, I was very proud of that C-. minus. And I went to geometry after that, and I would not have went to geometry had I not had to go to geometry. But I had to. And I hated it. Hated every math, hated math in high school. And regret it to the day that I didn't apply myself better in high school. But, but anyway. Um, and I didn't do well in geometry, though I did pass. That's, that's all I'm going to tell you about that story. No. God says, I'm going to keep this very simple. It's you. It's me. It's our communion. I've given you a body to, so, you can so you can enjoy the world that has given. So you can breathe in the wonderful aroma of the flowers. So that you can taste the great fruits and vegetables that I have given to you. So that you can touch and appreciate the feel and the different textures of things. Uh, 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 so you can hear, you can hear the birds and the animals commune as nature talks every morning. And, and I've given you these things so that you can enjoy all that I created for you. The only thing you can't do, you can't eat of that tree because you're going to die. That's the only thing. Everything else you may freely eat of, of everything. Then enter Satan. Satan is the devil. Satan is the old serpent spoken of in Revelation. Satan is Lucifer. All the same. He's good at keeping it simple too, initially. He's not, he's not stupid. And just as God made everything simple for Adam and Eve, Satan had to create a simple argument that could be received and maybe 
use it to deceive Eve. Satan was the most beautifully created of God's angels, but he was created. Understand that. He's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know. He doesn't know tomorrow. He doesn't know the next minute. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He is a created being that God created. But sin was found in him one day. And, and uh, I, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but you know, you can go to the book of Ezekiel, you can go to the book of uh, Isaiah, you can read about the, 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 the transformation from when he went from, a, from being perfect, okay, and what, what, what happened and what drove him downward, and it was his pride, it was his unbelief. Well, what did he not believe? You ever thought, you ever wondered, like, and look, a third of the angels he was able to deceive and to take with him when he was cast out of heaven. You ever stop to think, what in the world? They're in heaven. And yet, he got proud. I want to give you a scenario here. Like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Now, that's an easy one for us to answer. We know that the chicken came first because God created all the animals first. Okay, but when you don't have that knowledge, you think, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And there's a lot of people in this world would say, I don't really know. All right, well, we know, but nevertheless. Well, what came first, unbelief or pride? Does, did, did Satan's lack of belief in the Word of God cause him to be proud or did pride enter when he looked at himself and that caused him to not believe God? It's not important. That argument's not important. But one day, Satan said, I'm not buying into all of this. I can rule too. We can rule. And I can, I can lift myself up. I will, I will, I will. He says in Isaiah chapter 14, I think this chapter, and I will, I will, I will. And God says, no, you won't. No, you won't. I created you. Who's to say that Lucifer didn't argue with God on that? Look, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying right now. It's just things my mind thinks about. Who's to say that Lucifer didn't say, how do I know you created me? I mean, one day I opened my eyes and you were there, but how do I know that somebody else didn't create me and you just happened to be there when, when I opened my eyes? And by the way, who created you? If you say you created me, okay, you want me to buy that, fine, but who created you? I don't know. I don't know the conversation, right, that happened between God and Lucifer. All I know is that Lucifer became to, became proud and either the cause of his pride or the result of his pride was unbelief. And God said, this is the way that it's set up to be run. And Lucifer says, I'm not buying that. It can be done another way. I took, uh, I took the twins out for a ride. Uh, Saturday? No, it wasn't yesterday. Courtney, someday. Friday? It doesn't matter. Another thing that doesn't matter. And uh, the four-wheeler would not start. Click. You know, just click. Oh, no, no, no. It would... And I'm like, come on. Well, it finally started. And I thought, okay, well, I guess, I guess it's going to be okay. Put them on, rode down in the woods, and it cut off, and it would not restart. And then I noticed on a little, you know, the little dashboard, that's not really what it is, but you know, the LED screen there, low battery. And I thought, oh. before we got in the woods, though, Riley or Bailey, I forget which one it was, uh, said, I said, I don't think we're going to be able to ride because I can't get it started because it's a battery. And she said, it's not the battery. And I said, what do you know? You don't even know what a battery is, do you? No, sir. I said, well, how can you sit there and tell me that it's not the battery? You can't tell me that, right? No, sir. And, well, then it started. <laughs> and I'm like, well, maybe it wasn't the battery. <laughs> but, so, but I didn't bring it up. And uh, get on, let's go. So we go, and it died out in the woods and wouldn't restart. It was the battery. And I 
wanted to say, I told you so. <laughs> no, I didn't. But just because the battery appeared, you know, after a little bit of work with it, to not have been the problem doesn't mean that it wasn't the problem. It was still the problem. And maybe God looked at Lucifer and said, here's the way things are going to operate. And Lucifer says, well, I can't see all that. You know, I don't think that's the way it's going to operate. And God probably said to him, what do you know? What do you know? You don't know anything. I can see it all. I've already seen it all. I got it all planned. And that's the, actually, it's the reason why you've been created and everything's been created according to my foreknowledge. But the result of this, the result of his, of his pride or the cause of it is unbelief, a failure to believe the word of God. God said this and Satan said, I'm not buying it. Unbelief. No, here's what I'm buying. I'm going to exalt myself right up there with you. And my throne's going to be right up there with yours. And God says, that's not going to happen. And he says, well, you just wait and see. And God banishes him. You ever wonder, you ever wonder sometimes how that uh, 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 um, we think, why does Satan fight God when he knows the end? Well, that's the whole thing. He doesn't know all that God knows. We tend to think that they are both privy to the same information. Satan doesn't know what God knows. And somehow, defeat after defeat, and he has some victories that God allows him to have. So I wouldn't even really call them victories. You know, there's that meme that I keep seeing pop up on Facebook. You know, Satan's winning for now, but God wins in the end. And I'm like, no, God's winning right now. God's purposes are being done right now. So don't, don't even act like the Satan's winning a few, but God's going to... Satan wins some of the battles, but God's going to win the war. No, God wins everything, every time. And if you don't believe that, there's no wonder that you worry and fret and get anxious. And look, and we all do sometimes. I mean, we all do. Satan goes to Eve. And he knows that he's got to be very subtle. He knows he can't walk right in and say, listen, I'm Lucifer, I'm the devil, and he don't love you, and he doesn't want you to be, to, to fulfill your, everything that you're capable of being, and so you need to just, you need to just point your finger at him and say, he, didn't, he knows I can't win that war, I'll never win that war. So he comes in and he whispers, yea, hath God said. Just a little bit of a doubt. He didn't say God didn't say it initially. He just said, did, what did he say anyway? What did God say? And he said, well, he said, we can, we can eat. We can eat all that we want down here, but we can't eat of the tree of the God of knowledge, good and evil, and we can't touch it. And God didn't say that, though. God didn't say they couldn't touch it. He just said you couldn't eat of it. So Satan gets into her mind and gets her to thinking and he deceives her. Come on. Why can't you have everything? See, Eve, Eve looked at it as, as Satan tempted her, as Satan uh, uh, got her started down a path, she started thinking, she, look, she didn't maximize everything that she had. She maximized the one thing that she didn't have. She didn't say... God has said that we can eat of every tree, freely eat of every tree, except one. All she said was, God just said we can't eat that one. That's, that, 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 that's a bad position to be in when, when we are not recognizing all of the great things that God has for us. And we are now just focusing on the one thing that we can't have. It's a dangerous position to be in. And that's the position that he got her in to where she took her eyes off of everything that she had. And all she then her argument became, well, he just said we couldn't eat of that one or we're going to die. And we can't touch it or we're going to die. And then Satan's already working her down the pathway. And then he says, you shall not surely die. Then he just comes out and says, that's not true. That's not true. When you eat of that tree, you're going to be like him. And that's what he knows. And that's what he doesn't want. 
and you're going to have the ability to decide what is good and what is bad for your life. Does this sound familiar at all? Does it not sound like the very thing that we battle with every day of our life, whether to trust God and his word and just trust And when he says, don't do this, then we shouldn't do it. And when he says to do this, then those are the things that we should do. Instead, we make free choices. I know he said, don't do it, but, but come on. It looks, it just looks so good living in the body. A sinful body, a, a, a bad nature in your body, sinful nature that craves sin. We start listening to that. We're not listening to the Spirit. The Spirit's talking, but we're just saying, eh, you know, but you're not talking as loud as He is. I mean, I, I know. Look, I mean, I know. Hey, David, I want that. God, you got no business having that. I hear you, but this is screaming so loudly. I've got to do this. That's the battle. It's the same battle that Eve faced. It's the same battle that we face. Satan is a master impersonator, manipulator, deceiver. He comes in the form of something else that does not threaten you, that in and of itself is not a threat to you. So he comes in through that. There are those that will say that all sin, and it's just a statement that I've heard preachers make, all sin is a good thing gone too far. He comes as a impersonator, a manipulator. Mark 9, 17 says, And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. All of my kids had that. <laughs> uh, hath a dumb, can't talk. Spirit, believe me, they didn't have that. <laughs> He says, my son has a dumb spirit. He didn't say my son was dumb. My son was born without the ability to speak. He says, my son has a dumb spirit. What does that tell us? Normally we read it and just think, oh, well, he can't talk. But no, what the man was saying was that there, my son is possessed of a spirit that is not allowing him to speak. That's what's being said. The spirit is impersonating. The spirit had, had possessed the son and was impersonating a weakness, was holding the boy's tongue so he couldn't talk so that people would think he couldn't talk. But the truth of the matter is the boy could talk. It's just that the spirit was, was using him to impersonate something else. Uh, Luke 13 says basically the same thing as a, the woman, uh, the, the, a woman that was brought to Jesus was seen as a, a cripple person. But, the, but verse 11 says that the woman had the spirit of infirmity in her. It means that she really wasn't crippled, but a, a demonic spirit had possessed her and was making her to appear crippled. And, and in actuality, in controlling her, she was crippled. But you follow what I'm saying here? So Satan is an impersonator. His spirits are Im impersonators. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know what the word transformed means there? It means disguised. Disguise. Satan is disguised as an angel of light. And darkness and light have always been at odds with each other. They are even today. This morning before the sun came up, this room was totally dark. Okay, when I flipped the light on, then darkness left because light came in. And if I turn the light off, darkness returns because life left. They, they cannot possess, they cannot exist in the same area. And we know that when we talk about the forces of evil, we often call them the forces of darkness, as opposed to Jesus is a light of the world. So, so he has to, Satan has to appear as an angel of light, appear as something non-threatening, appear as something that can complement your life, appear as something that can lead you into a better life, to a higher level. That's the way he has to appear. If he just comes to us and says, hey, I got something that will be fun, but the end is going to kill you. None of us are going to say, well, I'm all about that. All of us are going to reject that and say, well, it may sound fun, but I don't want to die. 
So he has to bring in this argument as an, as an angel of light, if you will, as an angel of good things. He has to imitate God and say, no, I have something that will be good for you. And that's what he did with Eve. This will be something that's going to give you the ability to decide. You're going to know good and evil, and you'll be able to decide between the two, and you're going to become like God. And because Eve, Eve, Eve says, well, I love God. If that'll make me more like God, I, well, what can be the problem with it? And so she takes of the fruit and she eats. But even in the eating of the fruit, Eve is expressing unbelief in the word of God. Now, she may have not just said, well, okay, I hear you. I'm not buying anything God says. I'm not sure that Adam didn't do that. The Bible says that Eve was deceived. Adam wasn't deceived. He knew, and he rebelled on purpose. She was tricked. What am I getting at today? And I'm almost done here, but what am I getting at? I'm getting at unbelief, unbelief. Unbelief. It's what caused Satan to be cast out of heaven. It's what sent him to this earth. It's what ruined a, a perfect relationship between Adam and Eve and, and the Lord. It is what broke that spirit. It's what broke that communication, snapped it in half. It's what took the world uh, that over which Adam and Eve had dominion and they turned that world over to Satan. He is the prince of the power of the air. He is the prince. He is a god of this world, the Bible calls him. Why? Because that day Adam and Eve said, here, it's yours. We, not, uh, you know, we submit to God, but now we submit to you also through sin. Unbelief. Unbelief in God's word. Satan said, yea, hath God said? That's what he said at the beginning. And then, it, and then it lay just a little bit later, he says, ye shall not surely die. He basically just threw, threw the gauntlet down and said, he's not telling you the truth. And she said, well, I'll take the chance. There is no consequence to eating of that fruit. I'll take the chance. And that's what we do every day when we sin. We are saying... We are expressing unbelief in the word of God when we know, and that's what sin is. It's, it's uh, to he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. When you know right from wrong and you say, I choose wrong, that is sin. And what you're saying is, I choose to do this and I choose to just not believe that the consequences on sin are exactly what God said they were. I'm going to just roll the dice on that. Once he got her over that hurdle, then it was easy for her to just bite, to take a bite and to eat the fruit. She didn't check back with the spirit as far as we know. She never went and said, Lord, I'm getting some counsel down here to go this route. What do you think? She never did that. It just seemed so logical. It seemed so good. It seemed so right. And surely God wasn't telling her everything. Surely he was holding back. And surely, I don't know, you know, this whole death thing he's talking about, she probably bit it and then thought, was waiting to die and thought, well, I didn't die. So I think the serpent is right. It doesn't bring death because I'm still alive. Whatever the thought processes were in her mind, we don't know. But it was Satan's great sin was unbelief in the word of God. It became Adam and Eve's great sin was unbelief in the word of God. And it continues to be our great sin today, unbelief in the word of God. It begins with a lack of knowledge. It begins with a, a rejection of knowledge. It ends with a rejection of knowledge. Well, I think Proverbs chapter 6 says this, My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is lamp. Light and the reproofs of life are the way of life. God made it simple. But really, in a nutshell, this is what it was about. It was simple. Great harmony with me if you'll just follow and believe my words. Perfect harmony initially, and we can still have great fellowship and great harmony. Not perfect, but great harmony with God if we will but believe his word 
and not commit the same sin that Satan did, not commit the same sin that Adam and Eve did. If we will not be found in unbelief, saying, mm, I don't know. No, let's just know. Let's just know. Let's trust God's word. We are the ones that complicate life, not God. Sin is what complicates life. Sin is what brings confusion into life. Sin is what brings, creates bewilderment and dysfunction in life, not God. God says, I keep it simple. I keep it simple. It's not rocket science. Read my word and obey it through my power. I keep it so simple, I gave you the power, Holy Spirit, to empower you to keep my word and to do my word. Simplicity is found in Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 3, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's singleness, the no-brainer of it. It's very clear. It's not confusing. It's not gray. It's not muddy. It's very clear what God wants us to do. But because of our sin nature, we have that tendency to lean over here and just say, yeah, but. Yeah, but. And we doubt. And we just don't believe. Confusion, darkness, fear, shame. Remember the old TV commercials that, that, that it would, and maybe they still do it. I don't think they do, but where it would say uh, the following or, or, or the preceding show was sponsored by, and it would give you these. Okay, does anybody remember that? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thought for a minute I made it up. Confusion, darkness, fear, shame, guilt, death is brought to us by the following sponsors. Satan and his fallen horde of demonic helpers. It was brought to us by them. It's really not that hard. Put your faith in the Word of God. Study it, read it, dwell in it. Put your faith in it in spite of what you think, in spite of what you, how you feel, in spite of what your flesh is lusting after. Trust the Word of God. And you'll be fine. For salvation first, obviously, and then for daily life. Let's pray. If you're here this morning, you would say, I've never trusted Christ. But I want to stop rejecting him. I want to believe in him. I want to put my faith in him. I want to stop this rejection. I want to stop this unbelief. If you're here without Christ, and you may say, I think I know everybody in this room. I think I know everybody in this room and, your, and, and pretty much your testimonies. But if you would say, oh, my testimony is a sham. Don't go another day with that hanging over you. If your testimony is a sham, if you've really never trusted and everybody thinks you have, it's better, um, it's better to surprise some people and get right with God and trust his Savior, trust his Son as your Savior, than to go to hell because you're afraid of a little bit of embarrassment. If you were to say, yeah, I'm going to say it. I'm just going to say it. I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. Pray for me, preacher, that I would do that. If you lift your hand. Anybody in the room like that today? Okay. All right, let's pray. Father, uh, thy will be done in our lives. This is a very, uh, it's not a one, two, three point sermon. I just kind of just kind of talked through it from the beginning to the end. But Lord, you know, and you've told us, Satan would seek to steal, kill, and destroy everything that we hold dear, including our most precious possession, which is our relationship with you. He would seek to trash it. And he will accomplish that. Obviously with the aid of our sinful nature that still indwells us. But as he tempts us, as he gets in the way, he would seek to, to snap that relationship and, and just drag it through the mud. Through causing doubt and unbelief. Help us to be Help us to be true. Help us to be strong. 
in our faith, in your words, which should cause us to read it, which should cause us to memorize it. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Cause us to obey it. Why? Because we believe it. Holy Spirit of God, may your will be done in our lives this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.